Uh, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Schenker from Informalo, who's uh, the uh, lead editor at this uh, great uh, magazine that I'm sure you can pick up around. Lots of interesting articles about this as well. Uh, joining us at the end of the couch is uh, Brinduza Findaza from the Ground Up Project, uh, Bohana Bellamy from the Center for Information and Policy Leadership, uh, Philip Nolan from Mason, Hayes, and Curran, and Jamie Drummond, the uh, co-founder of One. So with that, let me introduce to Jennifer. Okay, thank you so much, Bill. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we're here this morning to talk about uh, big data and data privacy. Um, and what, what we hope that you will carry away from the session is the realization that the, in order to leverage the power of big data, we have to solve some big problems. Um, and those problems can't be solved uh, just by legal means. They also need um, some help from the tech sector, um, both in terms of designing the privacy into uh, what your company does, but also helping to come up with new tools that help some, solve some of the biggest challenges ar around uh, leveraging um, the power of big data. So with that, I'm going to kick off, and I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to tell you a little bit about who they are and what they do, Then we're going to launch into what I hope will be a very animated discussion of the possibilities and the challenges. And then I really, really would like to get the audience involved um, in with questions um, uh, and engage with our panelists so that we can help move this topic forward. Um, so with that, let me, let me uh, start by asking um, Philip, uh, who's a lawyer, to, um, to give us, uh, you work a lot with, with tech companies, uh, Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you, you are confronted with and, and, and how, you, how you advise those companies. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, apologies, everyone. I'm a lawyer. Um, I work at Mason, Hayes & Kern. It's one of the big law firms in Dublin. And um, I lead up a, a pretty big team of 20 lawyers that basically focus in technology, media, and communications law. And in recent years, while before that meant doing big outsourcing deals and all sorts of contracts, these days the majority of that team are dealing with privacy and data issues because that's they're the challenges that are presented by our clients um, in Dublin. I guess Ireland has a very unique relationship or a very unique kind of position in the kind of global data ecosystem given that uh, we have a huge amount of tech companies, uh, US tech companies and other multinational tech companies that choose Ireland to anchor their uh, European or EMEA operations. Um, it often flows from that that these companies will also anchor their personal data management affairs in Dublin. And that in turn causes the Irish regulator uh, of privacy, known as the Data Protection Commissioner, to have a pretty significant role in the global conversation around regulating big tech and big internet companies. So for a pretty small country, Ireland actually exercises quite a lot of influence in the global privacy conversation. Um, so a lot of our large clients, as part of the, the structures they engage in, have been audited by the Data Protection Commissioner, and, um, and that involves a really detailed look around their practices to make sure it's not about you know, asking are you compliant. They, they get under the bonnet and look and learn if these companies are compliant. So that's, that's really interesting work. But what we've learned from that over the last uh, number of years is that first, data protection regulation, it is effective. It yields results which ultimately are very helpful for users and, and companies or individuals that engage with these large tech companies. I guess the second thing we've learned is that the manner of regulation which is exercised out of Ireland is a fairly helpful one because it's a collaborative endeavour. It's not a case of a regulator looking in and then saying, you know, you must do this, 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 or else we'll fine you. It's rather more of a collaborative engagement and discussion. And of course, at the end, yeah, certain changes need to be effected, but the manner in which it's carried out um, is one which US companies kind of enjoy um, because they, they get to learn uh, through it and ultimately they, they raise the bar in terms of uh, compliance. So it's a very interesting space in, in Dublin as, as, a, as a privacy lawyer, believe it or not. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so let me turn now to um, Boyana, who you've got something like 20 years experience dealing with privacy issues. Um, tell us what you see as some of the biggest challenges. Right. Um, and that's really scary to say to a really young crowd here, 20 years of experience of dealing with privacy. Was there privacy 20 years ago? Well, believe it or not, there was some of it but things have changed. You know, this has become a, a major issue 
major business issue as well as legal compliance issue for really all organizations today, not just in the private sector, but really in the public sector. And you know, I have to put a plug here, the private sector, he's absolutely stepping up. It will be good to see the government doing the same, uh, deploying privacy programs and privacy officers in the same way as, as organizations have been doing. But why, why we are somewhat at a crossroad is that um, you know, we've had these legal norms, and, and Phil talked about them for pr probably over 20 years, but the legal norms really lack very much behind technology. The things that you are doing and you are inventing every day, um, organizations are really pushing the boundaries. Every business today is digital business, absolutely um, depending on the information and data about their customers, about their employees, about the potential customers, about the way they operate as well. And so the so. So legal norms alone are not enough anymore, in my opinion. I, prior, prior to joining the Center for Information Policy Leadership, which I now lead it's a think tank with a global privacy um, law firm, Hunt and Williams, and I'm based out of London, um, the, the center actually works with the organizations and privacy regulators and stakeholders to really create best practices advanced discussions on what the legal norms should be, what the policy should be, but also very much importantly, what the best practices of organizations should be. And this is where we, this is where I really passionately believe that some of the answers around big data are going to be. Um, the laws, as I say, are lagging behind. Uh, big data, Internet of Things are challenging some of these norms, some of these legal requirements. And so we need additional tools in our toolbox to be able to interpret these rules in, for the new information age. And the work that the center is doing at the moment um, with center members and, and regulators is actually trying to um, uh, lead on from our work on accountability, corporate accountability. What should organizations be doing? Can you hear me? Yes? OK. Somebody else's microphone, okay. Um, what should organizations be doing in order to demonstrate stewardship and leadership around the use of information about people? And, and um, the, the latest piece of work focuses on a risk aspect. So what we are asking um, from organizations, but regulators and policymakers, is to incorporate the element of risk and harm. So understanding when you are launching new products and services, new apps, new technology, new projects that use information about people, you must be assessing from the onset what are the privacy implications of what you are trying to do, what is the potential risk and harm, not to you, because we all do that. What is it to my organization? Will I go to jail? Will I be fined by regulators? Will I have a reputational issue? Um, New York Times or Irish Times or the Independent or Guardian uh, first page? No, not only that, but what is the risks and harms to individuals? Mm -hmm. So we are trying to reach consensus of what sort of harms these are. Are they tangible harms? And we all understand that. But are they non-tangible harms and risks as well? Can we reach consensus with regulators so that organizations know how to behave, how to design products and services based on risk and harm that regulators would accept as well? And we're also trying to ask regulators, could you also, pick, could you also base your decisions, your supervision, your enforcement on the risk and harm? Please concentrate on those who are creating harms without doing anything right and let the innovators, let the, those who are responsible, accountable, and good data stewards do what they do well. And so that's really the work we're doing at the moment, and that is my, my um, personal interest. And um, um, of course, uh, we've been working with the World Economic Forum and really leading on the work that they are doing as well. So uh, the use of big data, if you, if you now transpose the concept of harm and risk into big data, um, the data, big data, be it for commercial purposes or for benefits of society, does have some inherent risks. Correlations doesn't mean causality. If you are applying algorithms to information and then applying that, those insights onto the new group of people, you are creating decisions that may be correct, may not be correct. They may be based on inaccurate data or on incomplete data, um, data that doesn't suffer from lack of data integrity or quality. So are these decisions correct as well? You know, what are the impacts on individual? Um, you know, everybody knows about those um, uh, cases like a, predict a pregnancy predictor score by the target uh, supermarket in, in the US, where they were looking at the shopping patterns 
of their shoppers, individuals. They understood, based on data analytics, that particular people, before they even knew, were pregnant. They were then targeting these people with coupons, uh, mail, um, and as it happened, a father opens a letter and says, well, I, I, you know, why am I receiving this? And he complains to Target and says, I should not be receiving that. And they say, well, actually, that's wrong because there is somebody pregnant in your, in your house. And he says, who is that? Well, it was his 16-year-old daughter. So there is no damage there in terms of economic damage, but there's a huge anxiety, embarrassment, um, and that's just a small case. Uh, the other inherent risk, if I may just say, around big data is also that you may use information which looks not sensitive, which looks normal, but it, it creates sensitive outcomes as well. Um, and I think that's where we have to be really careful. And that's why some tools like this risk-based approach and doing risk assessments and developing privacy by design from the onset are really important. And may I say they're important for big players, big tech, but they're also hugely important for startups, for small guys, because if you do privacy right, you're going to actually be ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so you've touched on a lot of very important topics that we will come back to. Um, and one of, one of them was that there's, there is a difference um, between privacy issues, implications, uh, between the developed world where maybe people, people are annoyed that too much information has been given out and, and in, in the emerging markets where it can actually um, mean that they could be arrested or, 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 or even, even killed um, if they are identified through their, through their data. So there are huge implications there. But before we even get to that point, and that's where I want to turn to you, Jamie, is, you know, we, we are assuming that everybody is connected and everybody has data that can be leveraged. And in fact, there is this big disconnect because a lot of people in the world still aren't connected. Quite, and uh, look, so at one, we, we're a campaigning activist organization, a sort of south-north citizens movement working with policymakers to get better policies agreed and implemented to fight extreme poverty, hunger, preventable, treatable child, maternal deaths, a whole package of things that for the last 15 years have been called the Millennium Development Goals, agreed in the year 2000, underpinned in theory by data, by measurability. There were measurable time-bound commitments World, the world in this kind of fit of incredible generosity gave itself, humanity gave itself this noble gift, which is the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000. Most people don't know it happened. It was great. Um, we've been trying to keep these promises for the last 15 years that we made ourselves, trying to measure our progress. And we've done some well, some quite, quite well on some things. Uh, we fought back on AIDS and, and made some progress on malaria. Child mortality has been significantly reduced. But there's some problems with our progress, which is the data sets are in many cases crap. Uh, they're underpinned by dodgy data. Uh, in much of the developing world, the data is very bad. We don't actually know how many people there are, so it's very hard to know how many of them are poor. We don't know, uh, you know uh, where they live exactly, what they're dying from. And these kind of basic data questions are what we want a data revolution to help deliver in this next year maybe with your help and, and the, the help of, the, of this group on the stage, because the new development goals are being designed by Ireland and by uh, all the countries of the world and their representatives at the United Nations. And actually, Ireland does have a key role to play. David O'Donoghue, Ireland's ambassador to the United Nations, is one of the people chairing the process for the world to design the new world goals. And we're arguing that those goals, those new global goals, must be underpinned by dramatically improved data. Because, of course, 15 years ago, we didn't have the mobile phones. We didn't have the access to technology and information that we do today. What an exciting opportunity to get it right, to measure progress better, and hopefully turn data into information so that the poorest people whom these goals are supposed to serve can use this information to hold leaders accountable. But it's not going to happen right now because there isn't data in where most of the world's poorest live. And the data that exists is often terrible, of a very poor quality. And the uh, arrival of a sort of technology and transparency revolution is overhyped. I was just in rural Tanzania where, yes, some people have mobile phones, but most of them are not connected to any network. Most people can't afford to switch them on. They're really just pieces of jewelry uh, which you charge so you look like you have a mobile phone. You don't actually uh, get to use it much. 
Um, and so this disconnect between some aspects of the conversation about a data revolution when we're talking here in Dublin or Washington DC or Silicon Valley versus what's happening in much of the developing world is, is a vast disconnect. So that's one part of the data revolution I'd like to come back to for us. Another part of it is a sort of revolution in a sort of follow the money data revolution. We're doing a lot of work trying to fight corruption. So a trillion dollars a year is siphoned out of the world's developing countries, vastly more than we give in aid. And the role of our financial centers, and the role of our global governance and our policies internationally, we've got a big push for the G20 right now, and the European Anti-Money Laundering Directive right now, to, uh, for example, create public registers for the beneficial ownership of anonymous shell companies, uh, to force transparency on the extractive sector, which in many cases is going into the developing world, uh, and in a quite rapacious fashion, which is a huge missed opportunity because they could use the revenues from those resources to fuel development. Um, and to force government budget openness and improved data interoperability between all those kinds of information from governments and from the corporate sector. And we think that will help citizens follow the money from resources to results, journalists, citizens, policymakers, and that will help accelerate the implementation of the new development goals. So those are two uh, dimensions of this which uh, are slightly different than, than what we've heard about so far, but I think can overlap in this conversation. Absolutely. So, you know, things that you've, you've mentioned that we, we definitely want to cover in, in this um, conversation is, first of all, the lack of connectivity for quite a few people in the world. And um, there are offers to connect them, but what will be the trade-offs for that? How do we protect the most vulnerable people from not having their data exploited? And then the second part, when, when you talk about your initiatives um, for um, transparency and data, is this whole idea of transparency and trust that is going to be key if we're going to be able to leverage big data going forward. So we'll come back to those topics. Um, but first, I want to um, ask Brindisa to tell us about how um, her project is using big data to help companies in um, emerging markets and do some, some good in the world in the process. Thank you. So my name is Brinduza Fidanza. I'm the founder of the Ground Up Project. We're a startup based in Switzerland. Um, we started last year. My, my background is uh, primarily in climate change. I've been doing some work uh, with governments trying to understand how to move financial flows towards the green economy and, and what are some of the challenges that we have uh, ahead of us, um, notably among others for the World Economic Forum in the, in the past few years. Um, the, the, the biggest challenge, um, obviously, in that is that we have very few um, time left to actually uh, make a significant difference. And, and if you all are reading the press, and you must have heard a, a, couple, years, uh, a couple of days back uh, the latest report by scientists where, you know, right now we understand um, that climate change in the, in the last 50 to 60 years is man-made, and so there's no more dispute about that. Um, we also have, and you mentioned this, governments are gearing up towards a, a global deal, so there's much that, that a, a big push that is being done for next year, but the context globally still remains one of threat and one of vulnerability, and especially for the poor. We're in a, we're in a situation where, on the one hand, we need to get um, billions of people access to energy and water and basic infrastructure, and at the same time, uh, the planet is under stress and the resources are, are very limited. So how do we solve that, that problem? And you know, one of the, the opportunities, obviously, has been so far to go to the, to the big wins. And we've seen this in the world. People have started to do um, financing for green uh, opportunities that are mainly at the larger scale. But if you look at the, at the uh, you know, if you, if you sort of look at each of our economies, rich or poor, most of the, um, the gap basically lies in the small and medium-sized enterprises. They're very often quite small. They are um, invisible. Um, in the emerging markets and developing countries even, so to, you know, the poorer countries, is, they're very hard to access, they're very hard to start up, and they're very hard to, uh, to access resources or technology. So with that in mind and knowing that around the world, um, you know, just to give you a, a sense of the scale, there are about 256 million registered small and me medium-sized enterprises, and we estimate that um, the informal economy is probably double that. Um, there's a huge potential to actually make a difference in people's lives, in communities, and encourage people to uh, adopt green technologies. And at the same time, it would mean, in terms of jobs and impact on economy, a huge, a huge chunk. The problem, of course, is, as I said, is that these 
um, the small and medium sized enterprises are small. And so for, for our investment purposes, the way in which we look at projects and investors look at projects, um, these are very um, unattractive because you basically, your returns on these projects are non-existent. Some of them are very early stage. They're doing great things, but they are um, most of them not bankable. So the goal of the ground up project was to say, can we inventory uh, these projects? Can we create a digital um, platform that will inventory these opportunities, standardize information about their projects at a minimal level that would then fuel, if you'd like, the back end of all the crowdfunding uh, uh, financing that is being um, developed around the world, um, all the Im impact investment, and that is a scale that perhaps, you know, it will, it will come up to 500 billion to 1 trillion. That's the estimate around the world, so huge, huge market potential there. Can we actually give these projects what I would call the street view? Can we actually go down and, and see what they look like? And by um, allowing standardization and comparing information about these projects across a larger set of projects, then investors, be it government or private investors, can actually design flows that are much more interesting in, in big aggregated chunks. Um, you mentioned one of the challenges, obviously, is that um, half of the world is roughly unconnected. And so how do we, from, you know, from my perspective, how do we achieve the, the, the challenge of actually dealing with climate change and at the same time um, using technology to do that? I think for us it's a, um, and, and we can talk about this in, in, in the discussion perhaps, I don't think you can do it entirely with technology. You have to somehow mobilize people who are unconnected on the ground to get these technologies up. And obviously some of the challenges that, that you mentioned for a small startup to operate at a global scale and, and sort of solve a global challenge, um, we do get into complexities in terms of running the, the, the business on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, last point I'd like to bring into the discussion is that it's not enough, I think, to just collect the data um, and curate it, which is what most people would do. In the case of climate change, it's also important to monitor it. So what happens to all these people that are deploying technologies on the ground, but then you know, a year later, they're, they're, they're not functioning? Some of them may end up in the backyard, you know, cook stoves or solar lamps or what have you. Um, if we haven't actually a way in which we can monitor their lifetime and their impact on the environment, then we're actually at risk of not really understanding <coughs> whether we're making progress or not. Okay, thank you. So I think what you have just described to us is a good example of um, you know, the power of big data to, to change things. Um, however, they, there is a lot that needs to be done um, before we can fully leverage the power of big data. And, and so just be, before, before starting the session, we were, we were talking about some great examples of things that have gone wrong. Um, in the UK, there was a, a project where um, the NHS wanted to um, aggregate people's health uh, data so that they could look at trends um, and, and perhaps you know, further research. And there was a miscommunication. People panicked. They thought, oh no, you know, insurance companies or other people are going to be able to make decisions about me. And, and because of that, the, prob the program had to be scrapped. In the developing world, uh, there's been um, problems with, e uh, with the, uh, doing this with Ebola. Um, and so, so there are missed opportunities. We have the data, and we have the in many cases, the tech tools to be able to, to you know, extract important information, but there are all kinds of problems that are holding us back from being able to do that. So let's talk about what some of those problems are and what, what we need to do uh, to move forward. Um, who wants to take that first? Sure, well, um, is my microphone working? It is. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's great that the quality of data that is being collected is improving slowly, and I think with enhanced technologies and communications, that will increase. We now have the tools, as you said, the analytics tools. One of the perceived issues is that regulation is going to slow this down, because you can't just, it's not open season on personal data. And I guess just this, a key clarifying point around that is the regulation of information and data is mostly focused on the regulation of personal data. And a huge amount of good that analytics can yield and derive from data sets 
is not the processing of personal data, it's the processing of climate data, or the processing of um, information around disease, for example. So, so, so a lot of this space, there is actually a lot of flexibility in the law is not a constraint. Uh, legally, the issues arise when one wants to run the analytics tools over data sets that comprise personal data. And within that, then, you've got two types. You have regular personal data, and then you've got healthcare data. And if you're up at the healthcare data level, it's very difficult. Um, and then if you're at the regular level, just ordinary data that isn't uh, sensitive data, it, it's, it's still difficult, but it is possible. And one of the things we continually say to our clients who want to do things and run analytics is we say, look, must it be personal data? Can you first depersonalize the data and then use your analytics tools? At, because then you're not infringing any user rights. So that's a really important step mm -hmm. that companies need to consider. Often there's this kind of hunger to have huge data sets full of you know, additional personal data, which is not even needed. So depersonalize it. And then again, you're into an unregulated environment, and it's much easier. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly one useful starting point. Mm -hmm. OK, but so in order, w in order for all of that to happen, we need trust, we need transparency, and we need accountability. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, I think, Brianna, is, is where mm -hmm. you can, mm -hmm. can. No, absolutely. And you know, the example you, you gave on, on, on the UK NHS, I mean, th these examples are there all the time. Um, you know, we, th the, the surveys, surveys being done of people's perceptions and attitudes to privacy or privacy. And they always say they care, but you know, you don't care, I don't care. We use information, we click these privacy notices and read and consent. But you know, that doesn't mean we actually don't care just because we want to use technology to our benefits. We want to uh, participate as citizens and employees and, and, and consumers and so social media and, and get the best of, out of it. So, so, so th this is the, the paradox that, that so many privacy regulators, so many policymakers believe it's all about control by you and me as individuals. And I actually think that we have passed that point that we are able to control how information about us is used. So I think the answer, therefore, is shifting the onus from us, the individuals, the small person who, frankly, in developing, I mean, talk about developing world, you know, we, we are here empowered, but some people out there are not empowered. They live in non-democracies as well. So shifting the burden from individuals, keeping the individuals in the focus, in the center, but shifting the burden to the, those who want to use the information to do it responsibly by doing two things, being accountable, having responsible privacy programs and measures and things we talked about, privacy by designs and risk assessments, but also, and you have said it, Jennifer, uh, allowing for that important dose of transparency. So whilst control and consent, I think a little bit um, becoming obsolete in my personal view, um, in the world of interconnected devices, and even though it's not so personal data, everything is becoming personal data because what my fridge, the use, what my fridge has got inside is a lot of information about me. Uh, whether my micro microwave is now connected to my insurance company or doctor um, and, and transmits information about the use in our household, that may mean two things. It may mean I am a ru rubbish cook. It may mean I've, I'm too busy, mother of three, but I don't cook, and therefore I use a microwave. Or it may mean I've got terrible eating habits, and therefore I should pay more insurance because I, I'm uninsurable, uh, right? I'm unhealthy. And so it can, do, you, do you see what I'm trying to say is that sometimes information about things becomes information about us as well. So because of that, we really need to think about engaging individuals this, into this new transparency. It's not about consent, I repeat, it's about being open and transparent about how we are using information about people, what we do with it, and telling people what they don't know, and telling people the things that they may concern them, rather than telling them, by law, these long pages of privacy notice and policies Phil and I know very well that, right? And you, you know the privacy policies of some companies are longer than Shakespeare's longest plays, and that's not the place where we need to be. As Richard Thomas would say, we become a nation of liars because we all say, I consent, and you never read them. But I guess in, in many ways, you know, when you talk about transparency, and being very transparent with the users, I mean, ultimately what you're doing is, it, it's, it's, it's a means of getting implied consent, because if you tell a user, right, by using this service, on this product, this is what we're going to do. And, and if you communicate properly with them, not necessarily in a privacy policy, but in a privacy policy, coupled with during their engagement with the service at various points of engagement where they're sharing data, if you're telling them what's going to happen throughout, well, then they're informed. 
And if they continue to use it, well, that's, that's consent, right? I mean, in the, in the sense of you want to have an engagement with, with a handset, you can't necessarily have a pop-up every time you, you go from page to page to page. So I think really rich transparency, you know, that's repeated at a granular level of user engagement does comprise consent. And at the end of the day, I mean, you know, European law, which is the gold standard in terms of uh, privacy law globally, it does require that before large organizations do things with your data that you have to consent. And I guess this is where Ireland and the way Ireland approaches this very difficult issue, the Irish regulator says, look, consent can be implied if the transparency is good, persistent and clear, and not, you know, in a, a privacy policy that reads like the US Constitution. Wouldn't you say you want to just Yeah, just, uh, well, just sort of to say that this is a, a sort of a Western world problem, if we want to look at it that way. Um, and, and the sort of problem that we're trying to address, um, we actually need to, it's not enough to just scrape internet, and it's not enough to just um, look for the data. You actually have to engage people. What, what we're talking about is a radical departure from the world that we live in now. We, we're not talking about interpreting trends that are happening now, business as usual, and what are some of the opportunities that come from that. So the challenge is how do we use technology, but at the same time to incentivize personal action and, and entrepreneurial action on the ground. And I think it comes back to working in partnership with organizations that are on the ground, that have built already the trust of people around them, and not just relying on systems and on data collection to get that kind of, uh, that kind of outcome. Um, and I think we're very, we're, you know, as, as far as, as we see this, working in partnership with organizations like Jamie's or, or the United Nations or others that are trying to incubate that action on the ground is another way of looking at this as, as sort of getting visibility on what's going on on the ground and then and helping help get these people access to the resources they're looking for. But in order to collect the kind of information that you're looking for and you're looking for to, to, for the greater good, right, people have to be able to trust the government and companies, right? So, you know, they need to know if, if this information is going to my doctor or it's going to researchers um, or if it's going to an insurance company or it's going to some totalitarian government. And, and you need this audit trail, you need this transparency so that people can be 100% sure, and it's not just some empty promise, but like they can be 100% sure that they know who sees their data, under what circumstances, and when. And, 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 and the problem now is that people feel that this is totally out of their control. And, and, and the danger is that the most vulnerable people in the world, the poor people, the people in emerging markets who've never been connected before, if suddenly you have governments and or private companies who say, oh sure, we'll connect you, you know, they're not doing this for altruistic means. They're, they're doing it because, you know, the people are the product. They want to take their data. And, and the people need to know what's going to be done with it. Should we just unpack a little bit more the current frustration or, or dysfunction with the Ebola example? Uh, yeah, I think that's because a great idea. I, think, I don't know how much people all know about it, but then there's two types of real frustration here that we, we have and many share. One is that, of course, you know, uh, the mobile phones are highly present in the region, uh, not into the poorest communities, the very poorest, but, but still present t t across much of the countries uh, in that region. And the, uh, it, had the data been anonymized and had a good trusting relationship between the telcos and the government been set up in time, it could have helped accelerate the understanding of the epidemic and the epidemiology of it and helped it guide uh, better responses quicker. Um, but there was an impasse, a sort of a lack of trust between the government and the, and, the, and the companies, which meant that they couldn't get use this information that could have been used. Now, I should add there that this isn't just about trust in this case. In many cases, it's just sheer knowledge and capacity. They, they, just, they don't really know what was on offer uh, from, on the government side, and they were experiencing a crescendo, a sort of cascading series of crises, one after another. Uh, and, and this just fell off the radar of importance, when in fact it could have helped get ahead of a lot of them. Um, and in that, the international community needs to think about th that region of the world, at this moment in time, as our front line, not their problem. You know, this is a global health crisis, not a West African or Sierra Leonean crisis. Right. Um, it is our problem as well as theirs. Um, and we need to deal with this together. And there's a global public good as well as global health. Mm -hmm. And that is 
uh, how we use data in situations like this where there is an emergency, um, and how do we provide the capacity to help do that. Um, there's another part of the frustration I have to draw attention to, though, which is that you've all probably heard about huge multi-billion dollar, hundred million dollar, tens of million dollar pledges by different factors, countries, foundations, uh, to fight uh, Ebola and the causes of Ebola to some extent. Uh, if you try and analyze what's really going on with a lot of those pledges, it is a little harder to peel the onion. Um, and there's a practice in governments that is of you know, multi-annual pledges packaged into one big sounding announcement. It's often not new money. It would have been money that was already going to these regions, so it's not necessarily new. Some is, some isn't. They make it very rarely clear what is and what is not. And then, even once all the pledges have been made, the delivery of those pledges over time to which countries and which interventions, what's arriving in the dock, what's turning up in the health clinic. You would like to think that in this day and age, we have a better system and a better way to track all of this. Currently, it is not as good as it should be, not as good as it could be given the technology we all have. So, you know, both from the point of view of unpacking what the telecoms and the GSMA has tried to help create some protocols here to do better next time, um, there's some frustration. Mm -hmm. But also from the point of view of just tracking and following this money and these pledges that you'd think were for real um, and, and what they're really delivering has been a huge frustration. And we've got a resource tracker on Ebola, which is trying to real time follow the money to, from resources to results and delivery. And it's very, very hard. And actually, we need help. And the UN, though may not care to admit it really, needs help from num number crunches, from data geeks, from people who can just work the numbers and this kind of thing. So some part of the solution here is some kind of health data core for such emergencies that can surge for whether it's Liberia or for the UN or the World Health Organization in situations like this. There's probably, and there's probably some business opportunities here for tech companies, for startups to so help solve these problems, but at the same time, um, you know, build their mm. build their businesses. But, let, let me sort of add to that, and and um, the, the thing that I am seeing, and and it kind of talks a little bit to Jamie what you are saying, is that there is this reticence risk um, emerging, and that is many businesses um, and governments are not doing, not using the data to, to its full potential and benefits because of the fears around data privacy and data protection and security and perhaps the lack of guidance and lack of clarity as to what is allowed, what isn't allowed, how far we can go, how far we, we cannot go. And I think that's a terrible, and that is a really dangerous risk to be in. Um, just for information, Japan is actually revising its privacy law and it's, it's incredibly interesting to read the policy document um, done by the experts in the government, and they're identifying what they call a gray area. There's a huge growing area of grayness in Japan, which is with companies interpreting law to the extreme, um, and so therefore they're not using information to the potential they can. And frankly, um, this is happening again and again in telecommunication sector. This is particularly the case, um, and the reasons are multiple, but there is always this um, regulatory fear as well, and I think what GSMA is doing, which is the mobile um, uh, um, tele telecommunication mobile association, is great because they're trying, in the cases where there are lack of rules, and in the developing world there are lack of rules, in some countries, in some countries there are some rules, they're trying to create some kind of self-imposed, self-regulatory best practices, and I think that is really to be commanded. Uh, and, and to your point, we all need really to help create those rules, what those best practices are, because otherwise the data will not be used when it has to be used and when it can be used. Okay. So, yeah. so like, here's the problem, I guess. Uh, I mean, there's two types of providers. There's the telcos, they've got pretty rich data sets, and then you know, they support the platforms, if you like, the Facebooks, Twitters, and the social media, who also have rich data sets. And then you have a set of governments that, if they have access to it, can deliver a lot of value for the, the people they govern. The problem, and you've given a couple of fine examples of that, so, so definitely more cooperation is required. The difficulty is you have another set of governments, or sometimes the same governments, who want access to this data for a whole different set of reasons. Um, to track, you have a lot of civil unrest, obviously in the Middle East, North Africa, and you know, we've had 
situations that are publicly known where clients are being asked to deliver up information about their users, in, be it in Egypt or in Libya or whatever the country, in Turkey. So the difficulty is to reach a position for, for the, the, the struggles these companies face, be they telcos or the, or the service providers, is they want to cooperate you know, in circumstances where it will deliver good to their users, but in other circumstances, they're going to want to say no. And of course, these governments will say no, in all of these circumstances, you must deliver up the data. So in many ways, you know, the, the large multinational telcos and internet service providers, you know, they have a lot of responsibility and a lot of challenge to face. And they have to essentially architect systems and an engagement with their users and the stakeholders, such as governments, which, which basically kind of you know, carve this balance, basically, which is engaging and disclosing data when it's appropriate to assist, and when it's challenges to you know, imminent, imminent life and, and danger to users and individuals. And on the other hand, they have to be very careful not to oversupply. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a challenging environment. Absolutely. Um, I am conscious that we, um, we, as the co-op ticks, that we want to get the audience involved. Um, do, do we have any questions? Okay. Please. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Um, I would just like to know a bit more about your views on this relationship between privacy, big data, and the state. And I put that in the context, essentially, of on a very base level, if Facebook have my personal data, they're going to show me some adverts. If the state have my data, they could potentially lock me up. And if we look at a particularly nasty regime that was only around 20 years ago, East Germany, they were absolutely obsessed with data. They had a problem, though. Collecting that data and analyzing it was very difficult because it was all on paper. Today, though, the government has many more tools at their disposal to literally flick a switch and we could be in an East German situation. I think it's unlikely, but I, I would like to know um, how concerned you are about that, and particularly on your point about um, the regulation. So, for some people might see it that um, asking the state to regulate the state on privacy is essentially like asking a wolf to regulate other wolves to protect the sheep. I mean, it is a <laughs> slightly ridiculous concept. Anyway, I'd like to hear your thoughts on those issues. issue um, and, and you're correct when it comes to access to data the state can enact local draconian uh, laws um, which can permit it to seek to access and aggregate data sets and then to do you know even across all of the different public bodies and to run you know algorithms across that data sets with for purposes which would not be kind of supported under kind of Western civilization <laughs> norms and we see that happening um, this is where I see the role of, you know, if you look at the large, the huge data sets that exist in the world, a lot of them sit with tech companies and infrastructure, tech infrastructure providers. So I see, see their responsibility as very significant in that they're often the state will want access uh, to, the real rich data sets often sit with them and not the state. So it's for these, it's the engagement between these large tech companies and these, call them rogue states if you wish, which is a particularly interesting conversation because often it's in a, in a company's interest to build its user base as big as possible, but yet in the state where they're building their user base, they won't want to engage. And we've seen situations such as in Turkey where uh, Twitter uh, had a, a lot of significant engagement and ultimately Twitter was switched off in Turkey during a period of civil unrest reason, recently. And you know that was probably the right decision by Twitter because their view is freedom of speech and they're probably coming under lots of pressure from the Turkish government in terms of moderating content on Twitter and who knows what else was going on at the back. But they took a view, you know, Twitter was basically, well, well I think ultimately the Turkish government switched it off for a while. But that's an example of a flashpoint where the user is not part of the conversation. It's an engagement between the state and the large tech companies. Um, let me give you my perspective. And uh, so what I didn't tell you about 25 years ago, I actually did live, I, I, I was born and I lived in Belgrade in Ser what is Serbia now, but it was actually Yugoslavia. We were never quite um, Eastern European Stasi run regime of the Eastern Germany, but I, I, I was brought up in, in a country where um, certainly you, know, you were surveilled much more than perhaps today you are and I am in, in living in London. Having said that, um, look, 
it, it is not a new problem, but it is true that it has been uh, exacerbated simply because by the powers of, of computing and technology. Um, the state is not completely outside the law, and I think it's important to know that. And there are elements of state who could be and are, but, but ultimately the government in, uh, by large in, in the, in the um, um, exercise of their statutory powers are actually covered by privacy rules. And, and there are independent privacy commissioners who oversee the government as well. I mean, you know, UK Information Commissioner has fined many more government departments for poor security than they have fined companies, for example. Now, that doesn't mean they have fined them for perhaps uh, excessive uh, collection and use of data. We haven't seen that yet. But I think we have to have some um, belief, at least in our democratic uh, state and powers and, and the way we, in the society of where we live today. Um, there are some additional points to make are uh, that, look, the European Court of Justice, for example, has scrapped this data retention directive. This is the EU piece of law which required all telco and internet service providers to hold information um, 18 to two years, 18 months to two years, so that it can be used by government for you know, uh, security, ter anti-terrorism, and other purposes. Now, that piece of law has been found by European Court of Justice to be unconstitutional. It has been scrapped. It has been um, uh, taken off the books. Um, and the court has given some really interesting reading there about the need to be proportionate in the request for data, um, to be accountable. And I think from my perspective and what we have been asking is, just like the organizations have to be accountable and, and adhere to some basic rules of engagement when they're using data and doing big data, so should the government as well. Um, now, that's a, that's a, it's a crusade, it's a long um, a whole journey but it's a journey that we have all started, and there is much more debate about this everywhere around the world. That's all I can say, really. Please. Uh, we're seeing small signs of companies using privacy as a competitive parameter, especially in the US, yes. like Apple. I believe that European companies actually could do this with much more trust, uh, because they have a law who backs them up compared to American companies. Do you see these signs as well, and how can we help that market grow in Europe. Um, when I talk to startups over there, they take privacy for granted because that's something we do in Europe more generally. Uh, but they don't market this themselves on it. They don't market themselves saying we have, we are secure, we won't resell your data, etc. Yeah. I, I think it's a really interesting point and, you know, I think companies all over the world, are, especially you know those with a multinational focus, are realizing that if they're a consumer-facing company and if, if it's internet services, they realize that look, if they don't have trust, uh, they're going to deplete and erode their user base. So consequently, you know, there is a significant awakening, I think, and there is we, we are seeing more and more of it. I mean, the real issue is right. Trust is a great buzzword. It's one of the five buzzwords at the summit this year, right? You know, it's cutting behind that, right? You know. What does it mean? It means you know good transparency, good security, you know good ongoing communication with users. So companies are calling out, yeah, we're really big on trust and they're trying to you know grow their user base. But you know the reality is they have to sort of couple that with real measures. But but we find, I mean, I think users, especially Europeans who've grown up for the last 20 years with privacy law, they understand that they're becoming quite equipped in under, you know our, 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 in terms of their knowledge of it and. They're expectocrats now, and they, they are cherry picking in terms of services mm -hmm. and in terms of whose privacy, you know, uh, who's big on privacy and who isn't, and whose apps are leaky and whose are secure. And you find users more, more and more know these things. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I, th I think that there is an interesting paradox. You know, U.S. and you, you would have seen that is traditionally seen as not having as strict privacy laws and regulation the way Europe does. But there's this huge uh, pressure and understanding and an industry of privacy professionals, big, big, big budgets, big teams, big legal uh, spend, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in Europe, you know, you have this poor little lawyer ticking the boxes and, and doing the, the privacy registration. And you know, how does that help me as an individual protect my privacy? Things will change. I think that we are seeing more competition on privacy. And perhaps it's happening in business to business sector. Look at the cloud um, uh, or outsourcing business advisors, uh, service providers. I was leading privacy for Accenture for 12 years. And you know what Microsoft is doing now with the ISO cloud and privacy security standards. Many organizations are trying to get certifications where privacy and security become part of their the business offering. Um, uh, we privacy professionals have 
learned a long time ago that you're not going to sell privacy internally to your CEO or your general counsel or your board or somebody who's funding you by saying this is to do with legal compliance. No, right? We, we have to go beyond legal compliance. Privacy is good for business. It's essential for business because in order for you to unpack this huge potential of big data and data as an asset, you have to solve privacy. You have to address it proactively rather than defensively. And I mean, when I talk to senior leadership, that's the way I, I'm selling and I'm talking. And you know, they, they kind of get that, right? People get excited about that. They don't get excited when you tell them you have to do because the law says so, right? Yeah. That's not. So. Now, whether there is investment in startups who are actually creating privacy enhancing technologies and things like that, I think we're seeing more of that in the US, but, but there are small steps done in Europe. Um, and finally, you have seen people like Deutsche Telekom and uh, Amazon, some other cloud providers actually competing on privacy and saying we are storing this in this country, we are doing this uh, with your information. So, um, so I think you make a great point that, that privacy can be great for business. Does anybody on the panel want to tackle the, you know, the question of, you know, what are some of the tech tools that are missing today? Where are the opportunities for startups to, to actually solve some of these problems? I think problems? we should ask this audience. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us. Uh, Is this on? Well, sorry. Um, I was actually going to make a comment a little earlier, but as I work in private sector um, around some of the partnerships, and there's actually a session tomorrow that we'll, we'll dive in a little bit deeper, but I work for Microsoft and I run our partnerships within the humanitarian and international organization um, space. And for the example of Ebola right now, we were brought in by WHO and we have a specific disaster response organization that they, their role is to come in and get out. And so we're working with WHO, WHO on building a data hub. So they are the ones that, that every, um, organization, every member state is looking to them to be the catalyst of collecting, analyzing, and distributing that information. But our role is to go in, make sure that it's a secure architecture, then do the capacity and, 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 and education for that organization to then pass on. And so it is a critical role for private sector and even startups, but, mm -hmm. but to then go back to the security architecture, to really look at a sustainable model that we have privacy um, at the at the heart of this, and a, a very good secure model on that as well. Can I just ask: Are you um, tracking the, epi the, the epidemic, or are you, are you are you tracking the resources, or both? Right now, looking at the epidemic, not necessarily the resources, but that could come in. We should talk then, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question in the back. So my question was more about, um, so as the algorithms that we use to analyze the data get more complex, um, there's scope for errors to occur due to either just human neglect or also could be willful negligence sometimes. And people could cook the books, and especially when government policy and massive decisions which affect a huge amount of people could rest on the results of certain analyses. Um, so I'm just wondering, is there any thought given to how we could put in place measures, maybe people could depersonalize the data and release public data sets and there could be some transparency there in the sense where, or is that an aspect that's been thought about in, in yeah. this at all? I mean, sure, as, as I said earlier, I mean, you're right, I mean, algorithms are insanely complex and often the algorithms are not designed by a single person, but they're designed by teams and teams of people over, over many years and often with source code, you know, there might be a lot of proprietary code and interweaved with that is lots of open source code. So there can be kinks and bugs in terms of the output of algorithms. Um, organizations who d deploy algorithms to work on data sets which in have personal data have an obligation to make sure the personal data going in and that the personal data that comes out is accurate. That's an obligation of organizations. So in order to manage that, it goes back to my earlier point, if there's doubts around the, uh, the capacity of the algorithm, algorithm to be accurate, well then the outputs ideally, if they're gonna be personal data and if they're gonna be relied on, they should be, they should be depersonalized. And that's, that's the whole, con we talk about privacy by design, one of the key sub-principles of that is data minimization. And what I mean by that is personal data minimization, because a lot of the time the really useful statistics and the derived outcomes of the algorithm, we don't need to know it on, a, on an individual by individual basis, we need to know it on a demographic basis, on a geographic basis, 
So um, that, that certainly, you know, that, that approach solves a few different problems, I think. And, and maybe, maybe to kind of link your previous questions, what are the tools and technologies? I think certainly, if you can avoid actually analyzing personal data uh, and getting insights from what is personally identifiable data, but if you can anonymize or de-identify data, that really, really is the best way forward, and that has to be the most robust technology you can possibly look at, but that has to be coupled because no anonymization, and you probably know that better as technologists, is perfect. I mean, we have had cases where researchers have de-identified, sorry, re-identified anonymous data again, and regulators don't believe us anymore. And so if you really want to convince the regulator that you are truly dealing with aggregate anonymous data, you have to deploy the robust technology, but you also have to do some organizational uh, safeguards and measures. You have to take commitments to firewall, to not re-identify data. You have to take contractual commitments downstream to make sure the third parties to whom you release this don't do the same, etc. So that's where we come back again, you know, tools, rules, technology, and accountability that is policeable, enforceable, uh, and auditable at the end, and scalable. So. Okay. Did we have any other? Yeah. One in back. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, wanted to make a comment, actually. I'm kind of interested in the language that's still being used around the issue of data and um, the, uh, the fact that we're still using words like privacy. And I suppose I, I would feel that uh, at this stage it should be described as publicity. So once, once information and data is handed to a third party, in effect it has been published and that the default should be looking at it from a publicity point of view because I think a lot of people still look at it with an implied um, uh, idea of trust and therefore that it's, it, it's private. That's just a general comment in terms of the language. And I think moving forward, I think it would actually be more useful if people viewed it in terms of the publication of data rather than the idea of privacy. So cause I think once it goes outside the domain of your own personal realm or business, it's really in the public domain. So that's just a general thing with regard to language. Um, I think with regard to some of the organization cultures, in interesting, like some of the mobile um, telecom providers or that, uh, where they hold information, and I find it interesting that if my mobile provider contacts me uh, from a call center where they have no uh, caller ID, the first thing they ask me is, can you please give me your name yeah. and your date of birth? Now, the fact that I refuse to engage with them when yeah. they call me, so they, I, I think the idea that companies don't realize that, first of all, they held that information so that when I contacted them, they could validate who I was, but it wasn't for their use to, uh, to, to, to expect me, because I, I can't validate who they are. So it's not a reciprocated um, arrangement, and perhaps I should have um, a, a, a series of questions I can give them to validate who they are. So I think there's, there's ideas around reciprocation as well. So words like trust, as you mentioned earlier, are sort of, they're, they're buzzwords, but do we really understand in actual fact that these are about decisions and mutual decisions sometimes? It's a huge issue. We need to give a very rapid answer though because we're already over time. <laughs> we'll have another panel on this, come on. Yes, <laughs> we're here for the rest. Yeah. About I am with you, but please let, let me just say this, and I won't enter into the public data domain. Uh, just because something is in public domain doesn't matter, doesn't mean you can use it publicly and openly. The moment you pick it up and want to use it and reuse it and scrape it and analyze it, you become subject to the law. That's the law. Now, should it be like that? It's a second, secondary question, but maybe offline, I'm happy to talk to you. Do you want to? But just going to, I guess we're, we're sort of going to the closing, closing round of comments, so perhaps just in continuation to what was just said, um, we do have a responsibility to behave ethically with respect to, to the data that we're collecting. Another angle, given that we're, we are trying to use technology to change uh, a situation in which you want to um, address a, a major global challenge is to try to understand what drives that change. And so uh, since we're collecting, for example, information about people's projects, it is our responsibility to also understand what drives change in, in someone's enterprise. What are some of the things that actually are useful for them to share? And what are some of those things that would affect their competitiveness, for example? And so to operate in a way in which the system allows them to benefit and to learn from each other and change that entrepreneurial domain. 
Um, I wanted to also take advantage of the fact that not a lot of people talk about the environmental issues and using technology for environmental issues to say that we view this as an opportunity to, to prove that we can be a, a profitable enterprise and at the same time do good. Mm -hmm. And we see uh, us as creating value not just for our shareholders and for our customers, but actually for a range of other enterprises. So I would welcome a lot more tech and a lot more of the people that are here at the summit in getting involved in, in solving this uh, this challenge. Do you want to do you want to jump in on that about you know more collaboration needed between the tech community? Uh, and absolutely. Military? Actually, if I have one minute, there's a photograph. I don't know if it's uh, probably too late to do it now, but um, I just wanted to show you this because it's, it's just you know it, I know it feels left field compared to most of this conversation, but this is the reality I was trying to talk about earlier. This guy is the local village executive officer. He's the local g a branch of government whose job it is to know basic information about budget for the village, it's called Mafaluto in rural Tanzania, um, the villages, and the, the information on the budget, the population of his village, and the, and the budget that's supposed to go to agriculture, health, education, water and sanitation, is on that peeling poster on that wall. He doesn't know I've taken this photograph, I took it a couple of weeks ago in Tanzania, and uh, that poster that peels off the wall is just behind his desk. This is the reality of data in lots of places in the world. It actually, you know, it isn't yet an overweening, massive state that is um, uh, controlling everybody. It's an incompetent, non-capacity, not interested, unaccountable, crap at their job type of situation. Um, why? It's for another conversation. It is that. Why is that the case? Um, but we do believe that this is the sort of place where an infusion of people asking for better data and helping supply it is a very important idea. And just outside his door, there's a bunch of girls who have got mobile phones that don't work because they can't afford airtime, who would love to help him improve that data set and hold him accountable to do his job better. And for us, that's what the data revolution can mean. And when we've got the responsibilities and duties right, and we've got the norms and new rules and tools right, big data can play a really big helpful role in accelerating the improvement of that story. Thank you, Th and thank you all very much for, for coming. Thanks for coming up for a great day.